Hello, this is Heather Meeker. I'm a lawyer and venture capitalist specializing in open source software. This presentation is part of a series of video presentations on open source licensing. This presentation is about AGPL and why many companies will not use software under that license. First, let's understand why AGPL is different from other licenses. AGPL, or the GNU Afero GPL, is a network copyleft license. It is the strongest copyleft license in common use. There are some other network copyleft licenses, but they are fairly rarely used. AGPL is almost identical to GPL3, except for its network copyleft section. Let's take a look at that. This is section 13 of AGPL. It contains the network copyleft provision. It says, if you modify the program, your modified version must prominently offer all users interacting with it remotely through a computer network an opportunity to receive the corresponding source of your version by providing access to the corresponding source from a network server at no charge through some standard or customary means of facilitating copying of software. Now, most open source licenses have no conditions unless you distribute the software. And by the way, if you want to know more about what constitutes distribution, please see my presentation on distribution, which is part of this same series. However, AGPL can impose source code sharing conditions even if you don't distribute the software. For example, if you use the software as part of a software as a service offering, you may invoke the source code sharing provision. It's important to keep in mind that this condition only applies if you modify the AGPL code. So why won't your company let you use AGPL code? The answer has to do with risk-benefit analysis. On this slide, you will see a sample stop-go caution list of the type used by most companies for their open source compliance policies. You can see that it's stratified by license, use case, and whether the software has been modified. These use cases are usually defined in the policy. Companies typically apply different levels of process and approval to use cases, depending on whether the software will be distributed. As you can see, AGPL is usually on the stop list, meaning you can't use it without ad hoc legal review. Different levels of process for different use cases make sense for open source licenses. In an organization, it is not too difficult to tell whether code is being distributed in a particular use case. Most companies use a lot of open source software on the back end that they never distribute. This might include, for example, server-side software as a service software, but also development tools or desktop utilities for workers like browsers and desktop operating systems or internal business systems like payroll and accounting software. For decades, companies have based their compliance processes on the assumption that the highest levels of compliance effort are directed to distributed software. This assumption means that the company can avoid a lot of process for most of the open source software it uses. But AGPL breaks the paradigm that means using AGPL code requires additional compliance efforts. In other words, companies now have to take a look at whether they have modified software and are making it available over a network and not merely whether they have distributed it. Now, most open source code is used without modification and AGPL has no conditions if you neither modify nor distribute the code. So you might wonder why your company will not let you use AGPL code even if you don't intend to modify it. The answer has to do with cost-benefit analysis of using AGPL code. Compliance processes are costly. They are one of the main costs of using open source software. If the company approves the use of AGPL code, 
particularly for the first time, suddenly the company needs to add a new layer of compliance process. It needs to take additional actions if the code is modified and made available to anyone outside the company over a network. Many companies just don't have the process in place to trap this error, so to speak. One more point about AGPL. It contains mostly all the same terms as GPL3. This example policy puts all of the version 3 licenses, GPL, LGPL, and AGPL version 3, in a category that prohibits use in consumer electronics without specific review. That is because those licenses contain a so-called anti-TVOization provision that requires a distributor to share the codes and information necessary to reinstall modified software on consumer devices. Many companies are concerned that doing this will cause support or security problems for their products. AGPL also has some interpretational challenges. AGPL3's network copyleft provision can be a bit difficult to interpret. It imposes source code sharing conditions in favor of users interacting with the software via a network. And this pretty clearly includes SaaS use, but the language of the provision is not clear. It does not require that the users are outside the company, even though that is probably the intention. It is also unclear what interaction means. If, for example, a user is using a shopping application, which in turn interacts with a database licensed under AGPL, is the user interacting with the database? Well, not directly, because there is another layer of software in between. But take this to an extreme, and the network copyleft requirements might include components even lower on the computing stack, like operating systems. Because AGPL is one of the few licenses with this kind of provision, and the language is not clear, there is more risk in interpreting this provision than there is for other elements of open source software licenses. Sometimes lawyers at companies are also concerned that they can't be sure what constitutes a modification. AGPL3 itself defines this with reference to what kind of actions require a license under copyright law. But that is also not entirely clear because the copyright law is not clear. Do non-code changes count? What about changes to configuration data files that are integrated with the program? So if you are trying to make a case for using AGPL code within your company, you should be prepared to discuss this with your lawyer. If you want to champion the use of AGPL code in your organization, you will have to show that the value proposition is right that the benefit of using the code outweighs the risk and costs of doing so. One challenge is that the so-called killer app of AGPL was MongoDB, which as of 2018 no longer uses this license. Today, most well-known software under this license is developed by dual licensing companies that sell exceptions, and given the additional cost and risk that AGPL software might require, many companies choose to take the commercial licensing route instead. While AGPL has grown in popularity over time since it was released, it has never been in very common use, so you might have your work cut out for you. Well, that's it for this brief presentation on AGPL. If you want to know more about open source licensing generally, you might like to take a look at my book, Open Source for Business. You can download a free copy by visiting my website, going to the Links tab, and following the instructions there. As I mentioned, I'm also a venture capitalist. OSS Capital specializes in early stage investments in commercial open source businesses. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. This is Heather Meeker, signing off.